Here we go. Greg, this Greg is going to kick us off. He goes, Lee, I feel that the lack of a salary cap is ruining baseball with the Dodgers and Yankees affording anyone and everyone. Why is there not a salary cap? Would this be good for the MLB? Thanks. Greg, it's a good question, but there is a luxury tax and it. It, it's a steep luxury tax. And it's got all types of implications if you keep going over the luxury tax threshold. The luxury tax is established by the gross revenues that go into the pot. And that's why the luxury tax or the gross revenues go up every year. So therefore, the luxury tax goes up every year. So in essence, the luxury tax serves as a salary cap. I mean, for every Yankees, Dodgers, Mets that are in a $290 million to $305 million, they're paying monster luxury tax. For every one of them, there's obviously a lot of other clubs that are mid-range or maybe in the lower third. That's that's the beef to me. I think there needs to be a floor spending in baseball. The, the rich can pay to the luxury tax threshold, but there has to be a floor spending. If you're getting revenue sharing, you're getting the TV marketing money, you need to put that money back into players. Major League veterans, farm system, international signings. If if the luxury tax stays at, say, at 290 where it is right now, the rich can pay that because they're paying a big amount of tax when they go over. But if you had, if you had a flow to spending of $120 million, you know how many good ball players would wind up on the smaller markets because they're getting their payday there and they're still in the major leagues with all the benefits and working towards a pension? Why baseball and Tony Clark won't accept the flow to spending? Because the flow to spending is what makes the National Football League a success, and they have a hard cap. Florida spending makes the NBA competitive. It's it's saved the National Hockey League because everybody's got to spend here. There's an upper limit, but there's a bottom limit, and you're all getting a revenue share. It makes more money to go to other places. You know, that that's why there's good players in Winnipeg and the NHL, and that's why the Sacramento Kings have grown into be a good NBA team, and that's why small market NFL teams can still wind their way into the Super Bowl because revenue share, cap at the top, floor to spending to the bottom. You got to spend it. You spend it, you get good players. Does that make sense? Each according to his means. Yes. How's that one go? This is another goddamn communist thing here. Lee. You know, I used to have a real problem with revenue sharing and all that because I'm a capitalist and I take pride in being a capitalist. But my opinion changed because unlike, you know, Procter and Gamble competing with people over cleaning products, sports leagues need to have a reasonable level of competitiveness yeah. or parity. And I think it makes sense that the league overall should be as capitalist as they can, but to try to have some balance amongst the teams in the league. So uh, you know, I like your point of the floor. I think that's important. But it's it's weird though that if there's a salary cap, you can still go over the cap if you want. But, but you, you pay, pay a big penalty. Yeah, but, but I mean then that's not really a cap. So you know because Steve Cohen was willing to throw you know gazillions out the window. I mean, he was paying over what four hundred fifty million on his roster. Well, by the time he got paying the, the luxury tax. But the problem is if you go over it once, mm -hmm. the second year you go over it, there's penalties. You lose international signing money. You could lose draft picks. The third year you go over it, and that's why nobody goes to the third year. That's why the Dodgers went way below a year ago. You do it a third time, you forfeit virtually every way to get players from the outside. So that's, I mean, there are massive penalties. And the NBA has just uh, added what they call aprons. You're, at, you're at, the, at the salary cap level in the NBA, and if you go a little bit above it, there's an apron, there's penalties. You go above the second apron, it's catastrophic in terms of you lose draft picks, you lose your ability to sign players, you can't trade contracts. So it's in, it's there for a reason and keep having to add things because the super agents find ways to kind of circumvent. But the salary, luxury tax salary cap works because the, the benefit is you want a good product and your product could be the Detroit Tigers, mm -hmm. small market. Your product could be the Dodgers and the Yankees big time, but you want a good product, a competitive product. That's my biggest fear what the NBA has become is that all of a sudden everybody wants three superstars in every NBA team. And if you're in Portland, well, it sucks to be you because your ownership can't keep hmm. up with the other guys. Or what Sacramento or that that the NBA's got to worry about that, that we don't want five mega teams and 25 other teams just fill in on the schedule. Greg, great question. Greg ought to be in here doing this show. Yeah. On we go. On we go. Let's go here to Michael. And he says, Lee, quick question. Since the now passing of Pete Rose, wouldn't it be wiser for the Hall of Fame to induct him with a possible comment about the betting on baseball on his plaque? 
Bud Black, the Colorado Rockies manager, former Padre manager, uh, he and I had a long discussion about that one time over coffee. He's of the opinion that superstars who have accomplished so much in the game need to be in the Hall of Fame with an asterisk on the plaque. And once you see the asterisk, then you know it's Barry Bonds and he was a steroid cheat, but Barry Bonds hit 73 home runs and all those home runs. Or Pete Rose had the 4,500-plus base hits or such and such through so many no-hitters, et cetera. Um, social commentary, they want to keep it out of the Hall of Fame. But the guys who were superstars, yeah, there were some social asterisks to their own personal lives, and that was Pete Rose. John? I think that he needs to be in the Hall of Fame. I like I think you just tell the whole story. This is it's a museum and museums capture everything about history, the good, the bad and the ugly. You can't I don't know, you can't pick like some person from the Civil War and say we're going to cancel them and keep them out of a museum even if you don't like the way they behaved. So I think you got to you got to put the whole thing in you, full transparency. I mean his memorabilia is there. I've been to the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame by Great American Ballpark. It is really cool. In fact, I told the Padres, I told uh, Peter Seidler and Ron Fowler, I said, you guys need to go to Cincinnati and see what they just did because it's really different. But they have a wall beyond the front entrance. Mm -hmm. It's got 4,592 baseballs. They're all balls oh. from each game that Pete Rose had a base hit in. Really? Yeah. And there are, I mean, it makes up the whole wall. It's just really impressive. And then they got... They got uniforms and jerseys, and they got the baseball cards of every year that they were put out for the Cincinnati Reds going back to the 1940s. It's just, it's a, you know, video games and all that. It's just really cool. Well, that's what makes baseball great is their embrace of history. Exactly. The other sports don't do it anywhere to the same degree. And so it's just, it's just, there's a lot of hypocrisy with this Pete Rose thing. You just need to get out of the house. <laughs> I, you know, by the time we get to the second anniversary of this podcast, I want you to report back to me. 25 words or less, just written headlines of what you enjoyed the most about Cooperstown, Canton, Pro Football Hall of mm -hmm. Fame, Springfield, Mass, NBA, NHL, and Toronto. You're always wanting to freaking travel. So instead of going to French Equatorial Africa, just make a tour of the Hall of Fames and then report back to us. Well, I've been to two of the four. I've, I've been to Cooperstown and I've been to Springfield, Mass. Um, but the, the other two I need to get to. Oh, you got to go to Canton and... If you drink enough beer with me and sit behind the plexiglass, behind the penalty box at the Gulls home games. By the way, the Gulls, I was at the Gulls open training camp yesterday and I was out there and just met with a coach and general manager, et cetera. And they open American Hockey League season next week. They play in Toronto. And I was talking to their staff members and they're all Americans. And I said, you guys ever been there? No. He says, I don't care what you do in Toronto. You can go anywhere you want. They're up there. I think they're up there for four days. They they play two games in four days in Toronto to start the American Hockey League season. You guys need to go to the Hockey Hall of Fame. No excuses anywhere else. I don't want you to go anywhere else. I said, I guarantee you go in there, you'll lose yourself for eight hours. And you just come out the other side and you say, wow, that was really cool. But you got to be a hockey fanatic to want to go to Toronto and see the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's pretty neat. Toronto's a great city. Too. Oh, you think? Yeah, yeah. Next question. Okay, with some more hockey comments here. This is from uh, Callan, and he says, Good afternoon, Lee and John. Sorry I missed you guys on Monday. With that in mind, Lee, what are your thoughts on reducing the NHL preseason schedule and expanding the regular season schedule? There's an awful lot of talk about going to 84 games. It's not been approved by the Players Association. The, the issue is, though, you need time in preseason in the NHL to evaluate your kids. Uh, I would just follow in what the Ducks are doing. The Ducks have got a lot of young players, and Ducks got young draft picks this year. A couple of them were injured. Finally got them back on the ice this week. Those kids need to be able to get into a routine so you can actually evaluate, are they ready to play either in the NHL? Can you send them to the San Diego goals? Do they need to go back to junior hockey? Those are the three decisions that all these young draft picks they have to make. So you got to have some games. Um, maybe you're not playing your veterans because you don't want them to get hurt. Just ask the Montreal Canadiens who just lost Patrick Laine with a, a bad knee injury on a cheap shot hit out at center ice. So uh, now can you can you compact the schedule? Because if you're going to 84, you're going to eat up at least another week or two of what would be your NHL scheduling calendar. So that means you're going to have to compact your exhibition schedule and your preseason camps to a smaller number. And the problem with the NHL is you throw in these international competitions that they want to have, 
you know, what was the AKA Canada classic, or you go play these international, these world series abroad in the middle of the hockey season. So you're, you're stopping your NHL season to go play this tournament for a week. So you get, you got to find a way to make all these things fit. I do think they'll go to 84, but I don't think it's going to happen immediately. You know, it's interesting to compare how every major sport does their preseason. You know, the, the, the NFL makes you pay full price and they don't let you see the practices. But Major League Baseball, man, they, they got it down. I mean, you you go to Phoenix, all the teams are there. It's a really cool spring training vibe. They got all these merchants around the park. It's a destination for people to travel. Why wouldn't the NHL do something like that? Again, you got players coming from lots of different places. You got players coming from Europe. You got junior hockey players. You got collegiate hockey players. You need a window for them to be able to go through in the intense practices and then play a maybe three or four preseason games. And you have to make a decision. Am I put my veterans on the ice? I don't want somebody to get hurt like what just wow. happened to Patrick Line. And ba I baseball does it much better. I that being said, as much as I love the Cactus League, and I've been there and been in the grapefruit circuit. Um, I'd like to see baseball cut back from a 162 to 154. The grind of baseball is to me, oh, it's yeah. way too long. Well, I don't see the owners giving up any of those paydays yeah, exactly. along the way, but th just think about baseball. They have those backfields, yep. you know, that everyone can go to. Imagine if hockey had something like that. Well, you need, you need ice surfaces and rinks. Not everybody has two rinks. The ducks in Anaheim at their practice facility, they have two rinks where your kids can skate. The veterans can state, then you can scrimmage so you can do it. Down here, the gulls have one rink, the nice little rink here in Poway, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is open to the public if you want to go in oh, and it is. Cool. see them practice. But that's one rink, and I have to stop in the middle because they have to resurface the ice so they can go back and practice yeah. second half. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's different. Okay, next question. Next question. Let's go here to Willie. Is how much money do the Padres make from their local TV revenue this season? Uh, they won't talk about it. They made under the old deal with Bally forty million a year, and they lost that contract. Major League Baseball made them whole the first year. Major League Baseball probably made them, um, gave them a piece of forty million. I don't think it was that. Bally lost its shirt. Uh, how Bally ever came up with some of the numbers for rights fees they're paying all these markets is a reason Bally's in bankruptcy right now. So during the regular season, I think Major League Baseball. Has, has helped the Padres a great deal. Uh, and their whole idea is this whole streaming service. Um, when this whole thing blew up two years ago, what I was told from a baseball executive was MLB proposed, I think it was called Team 30. They wanted all 30 teams to give them, after Bally started to go into bankruptcy, to give them their rights, and they would form a, a, a baseball streaming service for every market. Well, that sounded great in theory, Padres did it. Arizona did it after they got canceled out. Now the Angels probably are going to do it with the 11 teams that got cut loose yesterday. But the problem is when you got Nesson, which has been in business since the 80s with the Red Sox, and is that's a massive regional market. You got New York, both the Mets and the Yankees have their channel. You got the Dodgers. What do they call that? Sportsnet? Yeah, LA out here, Sportsnet. LA Sportsnet which is tremendously profitable as a regional service for the Dodgers. Those guys say, no, we're not turning our rights that we work so hard to establish over to you. But with baseball, even though they can't do the Team 30, baseballs, if they're going to pick up 11 more at least, if not more. Baseball's going to wind up having a good marketing service, and they did a real good job uh, with Padre Baseball the last two years. They don't think they're bringing in the kind of money they're bringing in. But remember, the Padres also get the national TV contracts. And what they're getting, they get a nice cut. Every homestand I was told in postseason is worth $10 million to the Padres coffers. Really? Yes. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot more than I expected. Well, maybe, you know, if they, they don't have the Team 30, maybe they can have a Team 26 or sure. 27 and get everyone except Red Sox, Yankees, and, and Dodgers because they could find economies of scale and mm -hmm. probably share studios and and figure out ways to do the pregame postgame which by the way i miss i thought bally's did a really good job of that but it is funny that bally's is still hanging on to the atlanta braves i think about ted turner a tbs back he was the, in the first 80s. one that was he and, and harry carey in a superstation in chicago
Yeah, I just to me that was a mind blowing idea mm -hmm. that a baseball game, a baseball team, we could see every one of their games on TV. I concur. Now it's different. You can see it, but you got to pay for it. Well, yeah, well, there you go. Streaming yeah. service. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Thanks. Okay, let's move on here. Let's go here to David John Olivia. He says, AM 570 calling out Padre fans for not selling tickets to Dodger fans. David, Dodger fans got more problems than that. <laughs> Dodger fan, you know, shows up early or shows up late, leaves early. Maybe that'll happen this week in the, with the series with the Padres. But, uh, hey, I don't think it, there's gonna be anybody wearing blue at Petco Park. You can't get a ticket. You know, that stadium holds 42,400 something. And their announced crowds were 47,700, the back to back Braves games, because they stacked them in at Gallagher Park. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And the amount of money the Padres are generating from their own fans, because those tickets are hugely expensive for postseason. They're not regular season tickets, and parking is hugely expensive. Well, some of those uh, ticket agencies, at least the ones run by the teams will only let people in certain zip codes to buy, yeah. I think, to try to keep out the other side. But to me, I, I don't know. I've gone to games at both Petco and Dodger Stadium, and I've had great experiences sure. interacting with Dodger fans. In fact, the people that came down here to San Diego, they were cool and, 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 and polite. And it's not like the hoodlums that a lot of people like to say that Dodger fans are. I've never had that experience. It's probably out there. But, no, I concur with you. But, you know, not, they got Dodger fans fan whining about not being able to come to San Diego. <laughs> That's because the Padres are the in thing. They are. And it's great to see all that electricity. And then all the people that are so hungry for Padres content, like you said, after they beat the Braves last night, the fans didn't want to leave the stadium. They wanted to be there and keep celebrating. That's why I think this MLB 26, 27, whatever number it is, th there's a hunger for content, for Padres information. They just need to find a way to do it and monetize it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think baseball's had a rebirth. Attendance went up again for the second straight year across the board in Major League Baseball. That's TV great. And, you know, they've hit a wild a wild idea. This wild card playoff, this when it was one game, I thought, my God, this is tension filled. This might be unfair to the loser. And then they say, let's go to the best of three. That's pretty cool. And then the second round is best of five. I mean, we don't want to be playing baseball till Thanksgiving at Fenway Park in Boston. But the, the baseball right now, I think, is on a huge huge upswing. I agree. And I love it. I love it all. David, sorry. I can't, can't sell you any pottery tickets. If you're if we're in blue, not in my building. <laughs> okay. Let's go to a different David. This is David Ramos. He goes, Lee and John, can we get your predictions for the MLB playoffs? Who do you see at the world series? Kansas city has got to go to New York. That's going to be hard. That's going to be really hard. I don't know what to make of Cleveland. I mean, Cle Cleveland won 93 games. With Jose Ramirez and a bunch of guys you don't know. I mean, I know who Steve Kwan is, and I know who Josh and Bo Naylor are, but there's not a lot of big names in Cleveland. They hit 238 as a team. Yet Cleveland is really dangerous because they got really good pitching. I still think at the end of the day, the Yankees are going to win in the American League. And, I mean, Detroit, this has been phenomenal for Motown Magic, but this is probably, and they're going to play Cleveland that might be a balanced series. But I got the Yankees in the American League and the National League. We got to go through Dodger Stadium. Everybody else got to go through Philadelphia. But the Dodgers have home field advantage for the final round. But can the Dodgers get to the fall classic with a pitching staff that's got more talent on the DL than it's got on the active <laughs> roster? Big question. And John Riley says... Doesn't the National League seem more stacked than yep. the American League? Because I'm thinking, wow, this is a really tough road for the Padres. I mean, you know, being Atlanta's tough. Well, granted, it wasn't super tough. But going to the Dodgers and then to, to Philadelphia, if all goes well, I mean, that's really running the gauntlet. Yep. I mean, obviously, my heart is in it with the Padres. But if I'm a betting man, I would say the Phillies from the National League and probably the Yankees. The Yankees, yeah. Although I'm going to be rooting for Detroit and Kansas City. Although, wouldn't it be cool if it was Dodger Blue against the Pinstripes? Oh, well, then, yeah. Otani versus Judge. And all the national media would be back in their love affair with all this. So, yeah, that would be kind of a fun thing. Um, well, you mentioned Kansas City's got to go to New York, and all I can think about is George Brett and the late 1970s. Those were classic matchups. Pine tart. Yeah, that's a different era. I'm sorry, you can't <laughs> you can't go back to Whitey, Yogi, and the, Mickey and say, oh, Yankees are back. Well, um, Whitey, Yogi, and Mickey are a long time ago. Yeah, quite a ways. Yeah. On we go. Thanks for the uh, tidbit, David.
Okay, let's go here to Chris. And he says, Saw, keep in mind that the Tigers' magical 33-12 to run began the day after Javi Baez was removed from the lineup. Literally became a winning team with great chemistry hours after Baez and his wild flailing swings was no longer in the batting order. Also, no better bulletin board material for Dodgers than Tatis twerking wearing half a shirt soaked in champagne. <laughs> Take that, bitch. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, the rivalry is great between these two two franchises and you know, maybe maybe it's going to turn. Maybe it's it, it's time to turn. I I said m- a month ago, and what did they say on ESPN last night? I said a month ago on this podcast, the Padres are the most dangerous team heading to postseason. And here we are going to the second round. And what they say last night, exact same thing I said. This Padre roster can beat you. There's no doubt the Dodgers have great stars. I mean, phenomenal. That top of the batting order is amazing. And there's no doubt on paper that that's a great pitching staff. But that pitching staff is currently on the disabled list. And I just ask you again, once you give the ball to Flaherty, who will give you everything he's got, and once you give Yamamoto his four innings, who are you going to give the ball to for the rest of the playoffs for the Dodgers? Because I don't think they have any starting pitching. This is going to be so great to watch how Dave Roberts manages that pitching staff because he's getting so much crap from the fans. But he's got a, a lot of challenging decisions to make to kind of navigate through these different lineups. I'm curious. But, you know, as far as Chris's comments here about um, Javi Baez, I remember he was doing really well with the Cubs, signs the big deal with the Tigers, and he just sort of fell off the face of the earth. Injuries. He's got a a, a bruised spinal column. I, I think he got it sliding into a base. He's, he was on and off the DL multiple times this season. He's not the same player right now because he's hurt. That's I'm not going to dump on him I just because just I know he was a pretty good ball player until he got hurt, but he hasn't been the same player since. It's kind of like you and I both know Chris Bryant and how good he was with the Cubs and what he hoped to be with the Giants. And he went to the Rockies, and I thought, this is going to be a great fit. Home run hitter in Coors Canaveral, Denver, that's going to be great. And that poor guy's had back injury after back injury and then poor calf guy. injury and hand injury. And and he says he's not retiring. He's going to try to come back. He's going to change his whole workout regimen. He just can't stay healthy. It's just it's the cruel part of baseball. Well, no one wants to give up on the dream, right? You know, you're finally there at the big leagues and you can't perform. It's got to be tough. Good uh, good questions, Chris. Hey, let's go here to John. He says, at John, I guess talking to me, San Diego not only uh, loves a winner, no fan base in America deserves one more. And I, yeah, I, I got to agree. We've been, there's the San Diego sports curse here that's been killing us. Now, like I said, right at the end of that Padre Braves game last night, when they showed the Padres to come out back on the field, the fans refused to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they started flashing on the scoreboard as the Padres players are getting ready for a team photo and, uh, you know, beat L.A., beat L.A., and the fans started to chant that while the Padres are on the field. And I just thought to myself, how electric is Petco Park? How cool is Petco Park? And all the fans were giving those gold towels to twirl. And then I had that mischievous thought, damn Dean Spanos, how stupid are you to turn your back on this marketplace now and go – Go up on the periphery in Los Angeles where nobody cares about your franchise. Well, when the Chargers were doing great, I mean, Qualcomm was always jam-packed. Sure. You know, their their attendance dwindled. That ticket guarantee became a weird thing when the, when the quality on the field went down. But this is a good market, and it's a market that deserves a championship. Could this be finally the year? I, I will hope so. I told Peter Seidler the day that, and they announced the press conference that he was coming in as majority owner with Ron Fowler. And I knew Ron for a long time. And Peter knew me. I didn't know Peter at all. And and I went up and introduced myself. He said, Hacksaw, I listen to you every day at 4 o'clock. I made sure I was on the 405 in gridlock at 4 o'clock so I could hear the best 15 minutes in sports radio. <laughs> and I laughed. But we were talking about the marketplace. And obviously, we are talking about Petco Park. And I said, what a gem of a place, what a location. It's been so responsible for the growth of that East Village area. I said, I swear to you, this is a great baseball market. I said, you put a winner on the field here. You will draw not only all the Padre fans who love winners, you'll continue to draw a Red Sox fan, Pirate fan, Cubs fan, whomever. And look at the look at the attendance. Who would have ever thought this market would, would average 3.3 million at really high ticket prices? I mean, it's just... Fabulous how the community has responded to a winner. This is America's finest city. You well, know, most days of the week, yes. Yeah, it's a great place to be. I mean, can you think of any other big city in America you'd want to live? But there's, I mean, 
historically, there are great places with baseball tradition. I mean, the state of New England. Well, yeah, sure. You know, Wrigleyville. Yeah. There's a lot of in all things Yankees, Mets. I grew up, I grew up in the borough. I grew up on the Big Apple. I grew up on Long Island. I know the magnetism the Yankee and Mets baseball bring. So there are some really great markets and Dodgers. I mean, the Dodgers, that's a regional, big regional market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So San Diego deserves a shot at the ring. Hopefully it's, this is the year. Let's move on. Let's go here to Angel. And he says, hey, this past Tuesday was Michael King's coming out party. And that was vintage Sterling Hitchcock. He's tell you what, at the end of that game, I thought to myself and it flashed into my memory bank, Michael King equals Greg Maddox. You look, if you recall how Maddox painted the black, Maddox never gave your stuff down the middle hardly ever. And Maddox fooled you with a wide variety of breaking pitches and was always on the corners. He was pinpoint. That's what this guy has become. I mean, he has grown into really becoming a, quote, ace. Now, he's not throwing 103, but tell you what, he's so crafty and he moves the ball so well. What a spectacular pitcher. And I, I swing back to comments I made months ago. The intangible MVP on the Padres is Ruben Neabla, the pitching coach. If you look oh, at what yeah. he's done with each of those pitchers, how he fixed King, how he solved the Dylan Cease walk and home run problem, Obviously, what he did with Musgrove coming off the injury, what he's done with Suarez, you know, how he's steadied Morion, what he did with Martin Perez, who had a six ERA in Pittsburgh and Texas. And last we checked here, he was 2.68 with San Diego. Ruben, he's got the Midas touch. He does. I mean, and, and they, everyone preaches, uh, you know, all the great things that he does. But yeah, this Michael King Angel's comment is right on the money because he, he, he is Michael King's a stud. Mm -hmm. I mean, that dude gets out there. He's a horse and, and you have confidence in him like you do with a Nolan Ryan or a Roger Clemens in terms of a guy that's big, sturdy, and that can carry you for seven plus innings. And he and for a young man, he is so composed and his, uh, you know, his heart rate is very low. You know, he's just a very calm and in control, and that ball moves all over the place. So you miss Juan Soto? <laughs> no, not at <laughs> all, baby. No way. Yeah. Angel, thanks for joining us. Next one. Next one. I mean, there's so many comments here. This is from John Dowd. In hindsight, gambling in, in Southern o Ohio was a huge at one point. Don't forget Art. Like Schleister, I guess he's talking about. Well, Schleister or maybe Art Rooney. That's how Art Rooney got the Pittsburgh Steelers. He became the owner of the team. Art Rooney bet on horse races, made his money, and then bought the Steelers. Oh, you told me this. Yeah, way back in the day. So more gambling hypocrisy with the NFL. Oh, here we go. <laughs> now, that's that, don't be bringing in the modern-day casinos. But, you know, gambling obviously has been part of sports. Uh, you didn't, John, you didn't answer the question about Pete Rose, though. But well, somebody else will. On we go. Okay, well, yeah, here's, here's a comment about Pete Rose from Roger. He says, Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame, Dodgers in five over the Madres. I don't know it's going to be five. It's going to be tough. It I, it probably goes the distance. But, Roger, unless you've got any eligibility left, please tell me who is going to pitch for L.A. in games three, four, and five, or maybe even in games two. If they get if they get their starters in trouble and they have to burn through the bullpen, how are you going to have bullpen days, too? I just, Dodgers, just they just don't have enough pitching, I don't think. Unless every game is going to be 11 to 8, and maybe it will be. It's it's crazy. I mean, it's just mind-boggling that they won the division. And, you know, you were saying how the Padres are the most dangerous team in the playoffs, but they they didn't win the division. The Dodgers did with this incomplete, crazy mash unit of a pitching staff. I It boggles the mind. I, I'm anxious to see how Dave Roberts manages this. All I know is... Is it Saturday night yet? <laughs> First, it was Tuesday. Now it's Saturday. <laughs> hey, let's move on. Let's go here to Dave E.K. And he says, Pete Rose was worse than the steroid cheaters. He violated the integrity of the game. No Hall of Fame for cheaters and gamblers, especially gamblers, not just baseball. John T. Porter, NBA lifetime ban. Well, I think there's a sense of truth in that. You know, Pete denied that he bet on the Reds to lose any games. We don't know fact or fiction, whether that's a totally true statement. Um, the integrity of the game is the most important thing the game has to offer. But by the same token, we're, we're going to use the word integrity. We can't put Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa 
and A-Rod and on and on and on in the same sentences, the use of the word integrity there, because they have obviously cheated. You can yell at me, well, Lee, it was legal. Well, it was legal because the union refused to allow steroid drug testing till the bitter end. And then finally, Donald Fear had to cave in to public opinion and allow that to happen. But the integrity of baseball games was impacted by the guys that were injecting themselves. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can appreciate what they did on the field and acknowledge that they cheated or they gambled or whatever it was. But you just got to tell the whole story because it's a museum and it's about the history of the sport. Yeah. And if Pete Rose's jerseys, the cutoff Reds jersey, and the big red machine jersey, mm -hmm. if all that stuff is in Cooperstown on the first floor, then Pete should probably be in Cooperstown with a plaque. Yeah. With Tony Gwynn and all the other great players and just Put a star next to it. Put an asterisk. And the minute you see the star, you know what it represents. And then right below it, you know, there'll be like a little place to deposit a $5 bill for a, an autograph. Yeah. <laughs> next question. Okay, let's go here to Roger. He goes, LOL, San Francisco Giants fan. No wonder salty against the Dodgers. The reporter on the right, I think he's talking about me. But, you know, I, I was no, raised. Right. You're a dumbass. <laughs> go ahead. I was raised a Giants fan. My mother taught me at a very young age, we hate the Dodgers. We hate the Rams. We hate the Lakers. And it's in the drinking water where I grew up. And then I ended up coming to San Diego and it was kind of the same thing. So from both sides of it, you know, I'm a, I'm really more of a Padre fan than a Giant fan now. But in both cases, no go Dodger blue. But there were great players. I mean, McCovey and Cepeda. And, and I mean, just years and years and years of great San Francisco Giant players. And of course, I grew up back when say hey was a special thing at the old polo grounds in new york yeah but you know the giants with mays and mccovey that era kind of fizzled out in the early 70s mm -hmm. mccovey kind of came back later but um i that's when i was about seven or eight years old i started following the team so when i first really got into them it was chris spire bill madlock willie ontiveris um uh, no, well, Steve Bontevaris and Willie Montanez. Yeah, but th those guys are not the equal. Larry Herndon, the, Jack Clark when he was a rookie, uh, Ed Halicki, the Dodger killer. Yeah, but those weren't the, the equal of the baby oh, bull and no. Stretch and all those guys. No, and Juan Marichal. No, no, no way. Okay, let's keep going here. Let's go to Rap Albin Depot. And he says, I don't like the salary cap. I honestly believe the NFL and NBA and NHL have more franchises going through the motions like the Pelicans and Panthers and Senators and Jaguars, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the only thing is you, you can't police management. You can't police, is this a good owner? Is this a, a, a qualified general manager? Did they make the right draft pick? Can they survive injuries? You can't police that at the league level. But if you have a financial blueprint that makes the same amount of money for the most part available to everybody, then if you have good leadership, you can be the Buffalo Bills and go to four straight Super Bowls and be the old Minnesota Vikings back in the day or be the modern day New England Patriots with, the volumes of information the Belichick offered. I, I There has to be a salary structure so that everybody's kind of planned by the same rules financially. Whether your front office is good, that's up to you, the owner, to decide. You know, it makes me wonder, like, from a business perspective, you, you know, these guys are just insanely rich that own these teams. And it seems to me, for them, it's almost like a toy, you know, like a way for them to be like a celebrity and own a team. But on a Year by year basis, are these franchises cash flow positive? Yes, I think for the most part because of the NFL TV contracts, mm -hmm. and for the most part, you know, aside from some of the crap franchises that have run their franchises in the ground, don't draw, they make volumes of money with sellouts. I mean, the NFL TV ratings this this year were three weeks, four weeks into the season, are statistically phenomenal, better than they were last year. Uh, the Chargers Chiefs game the other day, last mm -hmm. Sunday, had 24 million viewers nationwide. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I mean it's, it's it's an event. It is. The NFL is an event now. If you screw up your franchise, like the crazy man in Washington, Daniel Snyder did, mm -hmm. or David Tepper's doing down in Carolina, it's a long road back. I mean, once you wreck it, and you make bad mistakes from a player personnel standpoint, that takes a long time to be able to get back. But no, the the league is it's um it's printing money every minute of every day. But you can print more money if you've got a better team, oh, right? Exactly. You know, so maybe these franchise owners that you know, like the Bill Bidwells of the world, are they just kind of saying, "Oh, whatever, we're just going to milk this cow"? No, I don't think it's that. I think they're just bleeping incompetent. Ah, uh, 
And you've crossed a few of those people you've worked for. So have I. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Good question. Uh, okay. Let's go here to Broman74 Dude. Question. This Padres series versus the Dodgers. Considering how hot Otani has been lately and the year, he's 13 or fit for 15 with runners in scoring position last 15 games. How would you pitch Otani with runners in scoring position? I would walk him every time. Well, you could do that, but then you got to face Mookie, and then you got to face Freddie Freeman, then you got Will Smith, uh, you know, then you got Teoscar Hernandez. They do have guys who can swing sticks and put the ball in, in the seats. So, you, you know, how many times you want to load the bases? Isn't that kind of playing with dynamite? Mm. Then we pitch around him and see if you can get Otani to chase. Um, you know, we get into the, the fun thing is when you get into late parts of games, call to the bullpen. Here comes my left hander, Tanner Scott. Mm -hmm. You're going to throw that sweeper. You're going to throw that slider. That's Otani. You're going to have to reach for it and hit it. But Otani can reach for it and hit it. Otani, I think at one point, right at the end, was 16 for 32 in the heat of the pennant race. Think about that. 500 in the heat of the pennant race. And what a what an unbelievable statistical season he's had. I mean, every facet of his game is complete. Now, you could bark back at me, uh, dude, and say, well, he's strictly a DH. Well, he's still got to produce when he's a DH, even though he hits once every three innings. But uh, he's made preparation a science. Uh, you know, prime example is what the scouts say. He was not a great base runner. He made himself through video study a great base runner in terms of who might have taken a lead off at first base. What does that pitcher do? He's got this thing down to a science. So analytics, it's more than just swinging at a pitch or running the bases. Analytics comes into play here, John. Of, I am preparing to face this guy who's the starter. We're talking specifically Otani. And I know what his strengths are. And I, I, there's a trend as to how he'll throw me pitchers and then I'll whether I swing or not. And by the way, if I get to first base, I know everything about his pickoff move and what he throws normally first pitch. He's throwing breaking ball. I might go because I can steal on his motion. I can steal on a slower breaking ball than I can a 98 mile an hour fastball. There's a science to the analytics to prepare you for it. And this guy I'm told is just fanatical. That's all he does is study. It's just amazing. I mean, this guy is a freak of nature because when we were growing up, you know, you'd pick, pick a player, I don't know, Mike Schmidt, 30 home runs, 100 RBIs, probably hit like 280. And we're like, that's darn good. I don't know if anyone's going to be better than that. And Otani is just blowing those old guys out of the water with these statistics that are superhuman, like we've never seen before. I mean, to, to Broman's point, I mean, yeah, maybe you walk them like the they used to walk Barry Bonds. Didn't they do that one time at the bases loaded? I, I don't know if it was the bases loaded, but yeah. You could do that, but then what do you do with the second, third, fourth, fifth guy in the Dodger batting order? Because they can all go yard. Yeah, I mean, Mookie <laughs> is a hell of a player. I always think about the Red Sox fans. They lost out on Mookie and on Xander, both great guys. You know what? I, I, a comment I remember seeing just recently was fascinating to me is people have broken down the Otani swing and, and how it's a little different. He kind of opens up those hips quick. And they said Jackson Merrill's swing is very similar to Otani's. And I went, ah, it is. It makes sense if you watch it. That's why he's got oomph. That's why that ball gets out of there pretty quick. For a little skinny kid, yeah. yeah. The one thing, uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, I had not paid much attention to Otani and the Angels just because the Angels are kind of off the radar. And when he got to Dodger Stadium, I saw him. His wrists, he's so fast, so powerful with his swing. You know, the, the, the greatest power hitter of modern day was Henry Aaron. Great wrist. The next guy was, was Val, Vlad Guerrero Sr. Phenomenal wrist action. This guy is beyond both of them. And then he's got the big and the power and the stride and everything else. He's just, it's a once in a lifetime player, maybe a once in a lifetime year that we're seeing right now. I mean, has there been any equivalent of this in another sport um, that where someone comes into the league and just blows everyone up? Well, Different game, but I mean, Magic Johnson was unbelievably gifted in all, all the things he did. Mm -hmm. uh, phenomenal. Uh, when Dan Marino first got to the NFL, nobody had seen the wrist action quickness to get balls out of there. You know, Dan had the Marx brothers. They had all those Duper and Clayton and all those receivers, and nobody ever seen a quarterback get the ball out of there that quick. So, yeah, they're based on the individuals showing up. Earl Campbell, that was that was power big boy football when he first got to Houston, Jimmy mm -hmm. Brown back in the day. So yeah, you know, and now modern day hockey, 
all things Connor McDavid. Prior to that, all things 99 Gretzky. I mean, these guys, you never saw this stuff on the ice before. So the great athlete shows up and can change the game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, Larry Bird is another great sure. example. Uh, but for me as a kid, the one athlete that seemed super human, human to me was Nolan Ryan because he could throw over 100 miles an hour. Nonstop. And now, like half the league can do it, it seems. But how do they, How long do they last? Yeah. Nolan was very, very different. Yes, he was. Okay, dude, thanks for joining us, fans. For let's do a couple more. Okay, let's uh, let's go here to Francisco. Hacksaw, what do you think about a rematch between the Yankees and the Padres? Wouldn't be bad. I think the Padres are the most dangerous team. I got questions about Yankee pitching. Once you get beyond Garrett Cole, uh, you're going to trust uh, Carlos Rodon, second half of the season. He really faded. Uh, the kid pitcher, Luis Gills, had a really good year. Uh, second half of the season, he had some health issues, so he's not quite as dominant as he was there. I don't know about the Yankee bullpen, but there's no doubt it, the Yankees are more than just Judge and Soto. But between them, I, I think that's 96 home runs. But, you know, Glaber Torres is a really good h- hitter. Um, Volpe, the shortstop, does not get a lot of national link. That's a really good baseball player. He puts bat on ball. So the Yankees, Yankees got some offense to go with the two big sluggers. I don't know if the Yankees got enough arms. That's why I said the Padres. Padres are the most dangerous or the most complete team in the playoffs right now. And by the way, hmm. the people that are bagging on me on social media, when I was critiquing the Padres, my house of cards comment, that's when they were underachieving. That's when they were not the same team physically nor emotionally. We got to the trade deadline and they brought in the two more relievers after getting a rise, the great leadoff hitter, the whole chemistry of the team changed. So the people that are banging on me saying, oh, you were burying them before. I was burying them because they were grossly underachieving and now it's come together. So I'm going to compliment them. They, they bag on you no matter what you say, no matter when they say it. When you get your own podcast, you can say whatever you wish. Now, the, I'm thinking of the Yankees pitching staff. Isn't Carlos Rondon on that? Yeah, that was it, what I was just talking about, Rondon. But he's he's healthy? Well, he's he was hurt. He had a couple of real crap years. He pitched with the Giants, was with the White Sox, and got to the Yankees and got hurt. Had all kinds of shoulder misseries. He, he had a good first half this season, but he staggered the second half. Now, he's back. I think he's going to be the game two starter, but what kind of quality start you're going to get? How many innings deep does he go? I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. You when want to fit I, some social media in? Oh, you, should I? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right. We're not going too long here. Okay. Let's uh, let's get these guys in. There's some good social media comments here. I'll let's, be the judge of that. All right. Let's go here to WNBA because it's got a lot of comments. And, and this is from RMA and it says, I'm a thousand percent against what these fans are saying. However, just because it hurts the players' feelings is no reason to kick them out. Yeah, but where do you draw the line? You buy a ticket to sit behind the bench. Shouldn't there be comments in good good taste if you're going to sit behind the bench? I mean, why, why are you making comments about race? Why are you making comments about sexual preference? Are you there to cheer Caitlin Clark or to cheer Angel Reese? Why why is John Q. Fan venturing over the line that it becomes a personal thing, black versus white, or personal thing about sexual preference? Where does that come into the equation? You tell me. I don't know. Imagine going like to Costco and then starting to heckling the worker because of their race or some other ridiculous thing. And that's what it's like. If you if you go into an arena and you're dropping F bombs or you know, slurs on any frankly, any category. Yeah, the security should throw your butt out. I mean, be a civilized human. That's what I think. But obviously, RMA says a little bit differently. I should be allowed to do anything I want when I get my ticket and sit behind the bed. Well, yeah, think people so. think, oh, they, they, some people say, well, it's free speech. Well, it's not because it's a private company and they can throw out people that are misbehaving. Okay. Thank you for the contribution. Okay. Let's go here to... Uh, uh, comment here from, uh, th- this is what I think what you were talking about. This is from Sumdro. How many Padres pickles does this guy suck? When the Padres exit in the wild card, I want to hear this man's intake on Padres. I'll be waiting. Regardless of what happens. By the way, they won the wild card. They did, yes. Okay, so good. So this was a, from a few days ago. I like pickles, but not that many of them. <laughs> um, even if, if they don't beat the Dodgers, that won't be a disappointment because the Dodgers are a first place team again, 11 division titles in 12 years. Now you may dislike the Dodgers amount of money they spend. You may dislike Dodger history. So if the Padres don't win this, this second round, say it ends here and it could, or could it, it could end in Philadelphia. 
I'll only remember this season. I'll only remember 38 come from behind wins. I'll only remember ninth inning walk-offs. I'll only remember the greatness of this pitching staff. I'll only remember the kid, 2-0, Jackson Merrill. Yeah. I'll only remember Arise getting base hits, regardless of what area code the pitcher was thrown in. So that's that's my take. I hope they go deep. This, this has been fascinating to watch this thing grow, see this community react. I'm not going to critique them because this I've been here since 1987. And this is coming from a kid that grew up in a baseball family. That's all I lived for as a kid was to watch the games in black and white TV. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> uh, watch watch baseball in the fall at sunset in October on the Eastern Seaboard. If this doesn't go beyond this Dodger series, I'll remember this summer. I think it's the most fun summer covering baseball I have ever had in San Diego. So what's the better vibe, um, Charger Super Bowl season or, or today with the Padres? Well, Charger Super Bowl season because I was right there doing the play-by-play -play and I was experiencing every step of the way in the interaction with the people. But this is cool. I mean, I, I, I like Preller. I don't agree with Preller's philosophy all the time, but I, I like Preller, his boldness, obviously great regard for Mr. Seidler. And I, I had a lot of off-the-field interactions with Peter. And before that, with a lot of different Padre ownership from John Moore's on. Um, so, I, you know, it's different being a talk show host and a, a podcast person as compared to being in the dugout every day or being in the press box every day. I'm still down there, but I'm not doing it to the numbers and lengths that I'd done it before because my work schedule has changed a little bit. But just to see this thing come together and to see the community, that's the coolest thing. You know, the, prior to that, the coolest thing I ever experienced was that last Charger season when they went to the Super Bowl and all the stadiums, I mean, all the, all the buildings downtown and in Mission Valley had lights on in buildings at night with a lightning bolt. Yeah, that was cool. Coolest thing I'd ever seen. And yeah. It just it goes to show when a, a franchise is really good and vibrant and part of the community, how it emblazons the community to bring it together. It's just phenomenal. Well, think about how the, the uh, Angels, you know, 20 years ago, they had the Thunder Sticks. They won the World mm -hmm. Series. And now all, all that energy away. is gone. Sure. It's sad. It, it really is. You know, are you a good owner? A good owner makes, makes good choices. Every owner makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. Are you a good owner? Can you continue to make the right decisions? In the Angels, Artie Moreno case, the answer is no. And that's sad because I liked him for a long time. I got along well with him for a long time, but it's kind of. That's kind of gone by the boards. Here's the most unique thing that I don't think I've ever mentioned this before because I'm a big hockey guy. The Anaheim Ducks, who have their own set of building problems, trying to fix that franchise after having won the Stanley Cup and it's all gone away from them. But they started a marketing campaign. They were just voted as having the number one farm system in all in the NHL. And they're force feeding all their kids. They put them all up at, on the Ducks roster. They just started a marketing campaign. You go to, go to the website or just go on the internet, Anaheim Ducks, new, new uniforms. They start a marketing campaign. They called it, this is orange country. And they've changed the whole color scheme. The jersey's all orange now, orange and white and some brown trim. Um, it's very different. It looks really cool. But they did this marketing campaign. This is orange country for the Ducks. Has a shot at Artie Moreno. You know, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Just, <laughs> I told I told one of the Ducks people a couple of weeks ago, I said, brilliant. Just the uniforms look great, but this whole thing. But they, they got a patch on their jersey, live in Orange County. It's really kind of cool. So, yeah. Are you good? Have you done a good job marketing? Do you make more good decisions than you do bad decisions? Right now, the Angels know you can always rally back. You can always fix an alien franchise. It took the Cubs and the Red Sox a long time, but you can do it. Yeah, that's a good. I, I like that angle a lot. Usually, uh, major any kind of pro franchise when they start to get overly marketing, sometimes they get too hokey with it. Mm -hmm. But I like that. Well, yeah, Orange Country. That makes sense. Good deal.
Okay, let's go here. Let's talk a little Dodgers. Uh, this is from a fan that actually likes Dave Roberts. This is from Eric. He says, I'm one of the few that love Dave. For me, I hold all the players more accountable when they don't perform more than Dave. Plenty of managers make similar mistakes or decisions in regards to pitching changes, pinch hit situations, etc. Postseason decisions are amplified, which I get, but man, it should it shows how hard this game is. I think the most difficult thing for Dave is trusting analytics versus gut feel, in my opinion. Well, sometimes you're ordered to trust analytics. That's a piece of this equation. You know, and then sometimes it's it's got to be done by the players. That's all. If Jackson Merrill doesn't get to that fly ball in the ninth inning running full speed in center field against the Braves on Tuesday, the Braves might win that playoff game, and we might be playing a third game tonight. Mm. Do the players accomplish what the players need to accomplish? It's a big issue. The injury factor changes everything. You know, the Padres just lost Joe Musgrove for probably the rest of the playoffs, but they have, that's why you have insurance policies, right? Yes. yes. So that's what my column was today. Uh, the Dodgers, did they make a mistake? This is not Dave Roberts. This then goes to Andrew Friedman and Brandon Gomes, the general manager. You invested $136 million in a pitcher with a history of elbow problems in Pittsburgh and Tampa Bay, and now Tyler Glasnow has broken down on you again. So, the success in the dugout starting with the playoff games Saturday against the Padres are not just on Dave Roberts, but it's on the players. Do they execute, get the job done? Does the aging bullpen hold up? And by the way, there is no Tyler Glasnell and all these other guys have physically broken down because of the Dodger way of how you treat your pitchers and want them to max out. So it's more than just Dave Roberts, good decision, bad decision. Why the hell did you do that decision? Well, Dodger fan always says like, ah, they could have just brought in Joe Torre and he would have had three championships. You know, it's like Pat Riley just roll the ball out for LeBron. <laughs> and, and I mean, how much impact do you think the the manager really has? I mean, yeah, they're they're going to make mistakes and maybe some may, maybe make some good moves, but I don't know if that's going to be as critical as you know if Otani decides to suddenly go over in a game. Players have to execute. Yeah. You know, it's it's not on Dave Roberts if Teyaska Hernandez gets killed by a fly ball in the outfield because he's kind of poor defensively. That's not on Dave Roberts. That's that's on, on the player. You could bark and say, well, Dave Roberts shouldn't have put this guy in right field, just make him the DH, and then, you, then what do you do with Otani? So the players have to execute. But it's a bigger organizational thing. You know, do you make the right decision on player personnel? You know, the Padres pissed away a lot of money on Eric Hosmer. Same thing on Will Myers. And now they were trying to build some credibility and get quality players in the front door, but they burned through a lot of bucks. You know, when, when we got to the trade deadline and they made the deals to get all these relief pitchers after getting a rise in Dylan Cease, they traded away 15 prospects. 15! And I was critical about But I also said, just you have to go back and find this in the archives, but I also said... They must be in the World Series this year or next year. Mm. They have to because the roster is built to do it now. They're built for October because if they don't, in two years, there's still no farm system. There'll be nobody to bring up. And in two years, everybody will be 35 to 40 years of age with five years to go in their contracts, and they'll be stuck in a pretty tough place. I don't know if you agree or disagree with me. I don't give a crap, but go ahead, John. <laughs> well, like you always say boots on the ground. Yeah. They're going to find guys. I, I have confidence there. The question is, you know, it, we're going to be stuck with these big contracts. They're going to take these players into their 40s. You brought up Will Myers, and I've seen some people on Twitter saying, we need to bring back Will Myers to throw out a first pitch. That'd be cool. the, and that'd be fun. He was popular. Yeah. He, he was a guy that got to this level and never got beyond this level. He first came in in Kansas City. I mean, he was going to be one of the cornerstones for that next generation, and he got to a level and never grew beyond it. And then he got traded to Tampa. Then he got here, and he was a good, steady player. But for the kind of money he was making, hmm. and then you know they got rid of him. Next thing you know, he's out of baseball. They say, how how could Will Myers not have a job? Well, you know, how can Hunter Renfro be a fringe player now? He was a really high number one pick. Well, guys, guys get their limit, and that's all they get. Have you seen the video clip of Will Myers at one of the bars in the gas lamp yeah. buying, buying rounds for everybody? And it was right after, I think, one of the Padre playoff games in, was it 2022? Two, two, yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, good he for was him. a good guy, but yeah. he topped out. Yeah, he did. Okay, a couple more here before we put a lid on this. Before we put a lid on it. Okay, here's uh, another comment here from Larry. Because you talked so much shit two months ago talking about Preller, about Soto, about how he gave away the farm. 
No, I was talking about, did they get the right players in the deal? And it's obvious they did in the Soto transaction because of what that pitcher became, Michael King. Now, they also used one of the other chips in that deal, Drew Thorpe, to go get Dylan Cease on a two-year rental. Uh, now, now, they're going to owe Cease a significant amount of money next year. In fact, the Padres, they got some tough decisions to make once this season is over, John, because Arise is going to be arbitration eligible, and that's that's going to be $15 million. He's going to be double. And the Padres are going to have to pay all that money because Miami's paid his contract this year. Mm. So when he gets to 15, that's Padre money. And Cease is kind of going to probably be 14 to 15 million in arbitration. That's Padre money. And a whole bunch of other guys, they have a tough decision to make on Hassan Kim because his option is 8 million. Now, I don't know if you're going to give a guy an 8 million. He's had one really good year out of the learning curve season and then the injury season. So they got some real tough decisions to make. But at the end of the day, complete roster. This time, they got to do it this year or next year because then after that, you're going to have so many old players. You know, and Michael King is going to be in for a huge payday too. So, But that's that's starting in November. We'll worry about November when we get to November 1st. Let's just enjoy this thing because this is, this is going to be cool. Yeah, and we have to stay focused on the present and in the moment because this is the this is a year where it could happen. But the Padres, what what, would, what should they do with Jerks and Profar next year? I mean, that's a tricky contract. Well, that's one five, and he'll probably ask for five to eight million. They'll have to make a tough decision. I I guess I'd give it to him on maybe a one year deal. I'm not going to give him three years, twenty five million. Not at his age. This is the one isolated year of of him having just a spectacular season. But he deserves a pay hike, and I'm sure the Padres will probably do that. It might come at the cost of Hassan Kim, because mm-hmm. you're you're going to have to move money somewhere, just because your established cornerstone guys are all getting pay bumps. Well, I think Tanner Scott's going to be gone. Well, he's a free agent. I mean, you yeah. could bring him back. Yeah. But I'm not sure what the price tag is going to be. But it it might be ten million mm. as as a setup guy or as a closer. Um. So they 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 knew going in some of these might be rentals, and so be it. But that's for November 1st. What are you worrying about, pal? Come on, it's just the first yeah. week of October. Let's enjoy it while we can. Is it, yeah, is it Saturday night again? Yeah, that's right. Okay, do you have room for one more? One more, go ahead. Okay, because we're already over two hours here. Okay, let's go here to Lakers from Generational Laker. Looking forward to watching the Lakers' young studs bust these other NBA teams' asses right before your very eyes. All you guys have done in the national media is glorify LeBron James while de- demonizing his Lakers teammates not named Anthony Davis. Austin Reeves, Max Christie, Dalton Connect, Rui Hachimura, Jared Vanderbilt are going to make y'all pay dearly for that this season. Mark my words. If they stay healthy, if the King and AD can stay healthy, then this is a pretty good basketball team. Uh, fascinating check marks. How good is J.J. Redick? Does what he wants to do work in the NBA with those veteran players? Item one. Item two. I think the most important acquisition is Dalton Connect. If he can be a three-point shooter game by game and be trustworthy, that helps your offense a great deal. Item three, which of the bench bunch can you stay keep healthy? Because that bench bunch was all chewed up. You know, a year ago this week when they were in camp, they had gotten some guys who had accomplished some things coming off benches in places like New York and Washington, Cam Reddish. um, Gabe Vincent. Gabe Vincent in Miami, et cetera. And Vanderbilt. And all those guys got hurt, all of them. So if those guys stay healthy, then there's contributions there. But I th- And then we haven't mentioned the kid, Bronny. You know, there's so many people spending so much time with conversation about the 12th man on the roster, Bronny James. We'll just see how he fits, how much he gets to play. But usually 12 guys on a roster don't get a lot of, a lot of reps unless their game allows them to improve as they go and then they become more trustworthy. I do think the wild card is connect. If this kid out of Tennessee can stroke threes like he did at the end of the summer league, but that's the summer league. That's not going against NBA all pro defensive guys, hand in your face, body on your body. If he can do that, then I think they're going to be pretty doggone good because that's that becomes a third tool. And I, I'm still a big believer and fan in Austin Reeves. I think they need to groom Rui Hachimura to be more consistent. There's a stat out there. When he was in the starting group with the other starters, they were 21 and 8. Now, that's a pretty good number. Uh, they were sub-500 when he wasn't in. But he's so hot and cold. So connect 
Rui to me are items 1A and 1B. Can they be consistent? If they are, I think it changes the whole scope of Lakers basketball. And to me, the Lakers have a, a low ceiling and a high floor. You know, I, I you know the best case scenario, maybe they finish fourth in the West. You know, most likely they're going to be a bubble team to make the playoffs. I don't see them like, you know, knocking off the Nuggets or the Celtics or, well, the Celtics are going to be dissolved. I think they're going to yeah. be able to afford it all. But I don't, I don't think they're going to be one of the top 10 top teams in the league because even if everything goes right, you'd be lucky to make the semifinals in the West. Well, if everything goes right, means AD and LeBron have played a ton of games, but we haven't seen that in the last couple of years because of nagging injuries. That's a big issue. And they're but older. They are. But if they do, if this is the one magic year, and then those kids, 1A, 1B that I just talked about, have good seasons, consistent seasons, now so it's a very different team. But you got to you got to keep the two superstars totally healthy. Hey, listen, we hope you have enjoyed the wide variety of topics on the table. This is